Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jeff Flyden, and you are listening to the NAMI Radio Hour. This is WRFN LP in Pasqua, Radio Free Nashville, on 107.1 and 103.7 on your FM dial. And the NAMI Radio Hour comes to you every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. And you can listen to it over the air or online at www.radiofreenashville.org. Briefly, I'll tell you about NAMI Tennessee before we move on to our guest, which is Dr. Um, Scott. (laughs) Help me. Because my mind west, I was thinking west of my mind. You know, I've gotten older. My mind forgets things, forgets things. I have to write more things down. Dr. Scott West, I just had breakfast with him at the Loveless Cafe, and we met him last night as well at a uh, preview party for the Jamma to Beat the Blues. Very fine uh, gentleman. We're glad to have him. But first, let me tell you about NAMI. Uh, NAMI Tennessee is an organization that does advocacy, support, and education programs. We've been down at uh, at the Legislative Plaza trying to support passage of Insure Tennessee, which seems to have hit a a dead end yesterday. We're very sad about that because there are many people with mental illness who do not have insurance coverage in Tennessee. In addition, many other people, veterans, people that are just laid off, people that have part-time jobs, people that work for companies that don't have insurance, and if their income is not sufficient uh, to buy insurance on the, the exchange, then they're just kind of out of luck. So we've been hoping to see that pass. It did not pass, and we're not done. So it may not be this year, but we will have Insure Tennessee uh, happen to expand health care coverage for low-income people, and you can help with that. If you are in the situation where you don't have health coverage, share your story. If you're a family member or a friend or loved one of somebody who is in this insurance gap, have them share their story and the way to do that is contact your local legislature legislator that is the best way so all you need to do is go to the internet our our gateway to so many things and put in tennessee and find my legislator if you don't know who that is and it will give you the email and the phone number where you can call and um, right now they're all in in nashville until the state budget is passed However, after that, they'll be back in their home district. You don't need to wait. Contact them now. Contact them any time during the year. Share your story. The only way that this will happen is if the legislators believe that enough people really need it, that they care, that that will impact their vote. So it is so, so important. Now, we've had a little bit more success on the advocacy side to restore the threat of reducing funds for mental health case management, and that mental health case management was very critical where a lot of people that have uh, severe mental illness have a case manager that helps them to work their recovery program to have some quality of life to work toward recovery and avoid uh, unpleasant outcomes like hospitalization arrest other kind of things due to their symptomatology related to mental illness so that was restored and we really want to thank uh, governor haslam for changing that and putting that back in the state budget so that's NAMI. Oh, one other thing, if you'd like to write to the show, write to info at namitn.org. If you'd like to learn about our classes, our support groups, our, our programs, go to www.namitn.org, and you'll find information there. You can also sign up for the e-news, which will let you know who's on the show each week, among other things. There's also a NAMI Tennessee Facebook page, and that's a great place to also um, – like and look at and get information. Uh, I now want to move to our guest and spend uh, the bulk of uh, the rest of our time with Dr. Scott West. I'm sorry that my brain just had a word that I'm not allowed to say, but here we are. And good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity, Jeff. Okay. And now I've got your volume up a little bit too. Uh, Dr. West, you were a psychiatrist. uh, And I'm really glad to have you here. We've been doing this show now. This is probably about the 25th or 26th show. And I've yet to have a psychiatrist. So I really want to thank you, first of all, for that, for uh, being here and sharing your time. Because most psychiatrists 
I think, first of all, they don't work unless, I mean, they don't get paid unless they're working. Uh, many psychiatrists I know, they're, they're independent. Uh, they have their own practice and they're not, they're not seeing patients or uh, when, when they're doing other things. So you took time out to be here and, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, there's a lot of questions I'd like to ask related to psychiatry. Also, you are the owner of Nashville TMS, and we'd like to hear about TMS as well. But just tell us about yourself first a little bit. Uh, of all the different things you could choose when you become a physician, you chose psychiatry. Um, what, what, what led you to, to uh, where you are today professionally? Well, I'll start with that. When I went to medical school, I really intended to go into endocrinology as a subspecialty of internal medicine. But through the course of um, medical school, there were a couple of things particularly that I uh, found interesting. One of them was psychiatry. The rotation was more interesting in many ways um, than others. And another was surgery. Uh, and I ultimately decided that I would rather 30 years down the road, which is where I am now, uh, be sitting talking to individuals about their individual circumstances than standing over an operating table doing something I'd done a million times. They can talk back to you. That's true, and that, that's, <laughs> that's a good thing because uh, it, uh, it helps to have that interaction with people. So uh, I was intrigued by the whole concept of um, uh, psychiatric issues and uh, the types of uh, difficulties that they created for individuals but also created for the uh, families that they're in, the systems they're involved in. So when, we, when we're saying psychiatric issues, you're talking about things like schizophrenia? Depression? Yes, the, those are probably the two that get most attention. There's a spectrum of things from uh, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety issues, panic issues, uh, and also um, uh, cognitive issues, dementia, for example. When, when I left my residency, there were two things particularly that I wanted to, uh, diagnostically, that I wanted to pay attention to. One of them was uh, dementia, thanks in part to um, uh, Dr. Wells, Charles Wells, who was uh, the vice chair of the department at Vanderbilt at the time and edited the first book on uh, dementia that came out. And another one was depression because I found it, it in, to be an interesting dilemma for people to have in such a, uh, a mixed bag of things. Depression means lots of different things. And uh, I find that depression, just like happiness, is a normal human emotion but carried to the extreme, uh, it can be devastating to an individual uh, and very limiting in their lives. Um, so I wanted to focus on things that uh, we're interested in now. Down the road, I find myself doing those things. I'm, um, as I tell people, I have three, three roles or three jobs. I'm medical director of the neurobehavioral unit at St. Thomas Hospital, St. Thomas West. Um, I have a private practice in psychiatry, seeing adults, and then uh, now do the TMS uh, as a part of that. I'm torn where to go because I want to ask you what is TMS, but before I do that, uh, there's a lot of people that take, the term may not be right, but uh, I think psychotropic drugs is the right term, but drug medications for anxiety or depression, a lot of that is not given by psychiatrists, it's given by family doctors. Uh, can you address that a little bit? Like, uh, who who sees a psychiatrist? When should you think about you know, I ought to have a specialist. Psychiatry is a specialty. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, about 80% of the medicines that are termed to be psychiatric are given by primary care uh, doctors of various types, uh, either family practice, internal medicine, uh, or GYN, OBGYN uh, folks. Um, and in many instances, that, that's, that's good. I think people need to go to where they get help. And if they are getting the help they need at any given level of interaction with their providers, uh, then I think that's wonderful. That's the whole purpose is for someone to have improvement in uh, their situation. There are times when uh, certain illnesses, whether it be uh, schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, depression, or other things, where things are not working as we want them to and people are not improving in the way uh, that they need to, and I think that's uh, when specialty treatment particularly is warranted. Uh, it may be desired earlier, but I think that's when it's warranted. Okay. So if somebody has severe depression, in their mind it's severe, 
It's been going on a long time. They've not had treatment. They have insurance. They'd call their managed care company uh, probably to see how the, the, the network works and what the coverage is. They might get a referral to a psychiatrist. They might start with a therapist. But if things aren't getting better, then there could be a referral to a psychiatrist, or they could even request that. And I think that leads us to TMS, because my awareness about depression and as far as I know, TMS is indicated for depression. It may be used for other things. You'll, you'll share that with us. But with depression specifically, sometimes people don't get better. A lot of people do get better, uh, but there are people that they've tried different medications. They've tried therapy. They're, they're not getting better. They may have thoughts of suicide. They may have trouble getting out of bed. Is this the kind of person that, that, that um, seeks out TMS? Or uh, maybe a better question is, Tell us what is TMS, and, and then we can move to, to who it's for. Sure. TMS stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, it's an interesting uh, technology that's an outgrowth of MRI magnets. Uh, after the MRIs became available in the 70s, early 80s, um, a uh, doctor uh, in Sheffield, England, created uh, a magnet of that type that could stimulate in the body. and he used it to stimulate the brain to see what would happen. What was noticed serendipitously was that when certain parts of the brain were re repetitively stimulated, people would report some degree of mood change. Uh, from that point, there was a lot of research. Um, and I first became aware of TMS back in uh, the early to mid 80s uh, when a patient of mine uh, ended up at uh, McLean Hospital in Har at Harvard in Boston, and uh, when she came back, she was a very bright uh, lady, and when she came back, she was telling me about some of the things she heard while there about different technologies and told me about transcranial magnetic stimulation. So I paid attention to the literature and watched it with interest. Um, what it actually is is using the MRI magnet to create an electromagnetic field. That electromagnetic field can cross the skull uh, without any problem and it can thus stimulate the brain. Now if we stimulate certain parts of the brain uh, in the motor strip for example we can cause uh, the hand to move or the foot to move that type of thing but if we stimulate other parts of the brain we can create other effects and in the research that was done uh, it has been found that certain areas of the brain particularly in the frontal lobe the prefrontal cortex does affect the the mood, and by stimulating that directly, we can cause some change in mood. That also stimulates the nerve fibers and the nerve tracts in the brain, so it extends beyond that initial area of stimulation and goes into deeper levels of the limbic system, which affect the mood. So you have an increased activity in the mood, an increase in connectivity between the brain and the parts of the brain that particularly affect mood, and thus we can see some positive results when it's applied clinically. It was ultimately FDA approved in 2008 for the treatment of major depression and that's what the FDA approval or clearance is at this time. Uh, there are a lot of other interests in uh, what it can do depending on where in the brain we're stimulating. I was at a workshop in Washington DC a few weeks ago uh, that had uh, some scientists from all over the country, from people from the FDA, uh, and some, most of the people there were particularly interested in the research that's being done for aphasia after stroke, for autism, uh, but there's other clinical conditions that TMS, I believe, will ultimately be approved for or um, beneficial in. It sounds like this is a... Um a technology that will lend itself to scientific verification of its efficacy. Uh, it it does, uh, and it is. I gave a talk in Alabama a couple of years ago and reviewed the last uh, eight or so years of research, and there's no evidence that it's not beneficial in depression. Uh, in any of the studies that are done, there's various parameters and how it's done, some of the technical aspects, how it can be done better. Uh, but it, it looks like a very positive and in, intriguing technology 
I think it's going to become much more of a standard of care as time goes on. Well, this is really good news because there's many, many people that suffer horribly from depression. Uh, how does it work? Uh, it, yeah, Yes, there are many people. Let me get to that uh, first. There are, uh, at this point, anywhere from 14 to 18 million people in the country uh, at any given time that are struggling with depression, and only about half of them get help. Um, TMS is what, but one of the tools in the toolbox to treat depression. Psychotherapy can be effective. Medications can be effective. We know there are lifestyle issues that can help. Nutrition, exercise are certainly supportive efforts. Um, and then there's neuromodulation, which uh, TMS is a component of. Um, but it does specifically work by stimulating the dorsolateral left prefrontal cortex by increasing the activity in that part of the brain, increasing the connectivity between the parts of the brain. Um, and when that happens, uh, even when people have not responded to multiple medications, TMS has a very good chance of helping people with their depression. Well, let, let's paint a more specific picture. Um, I've seen there, there's a chair and there's some machinery. So you sit in a chair, you lay back, you're, you're awake, you're not awake. I, I, I just have no idea. Great question because a lot of times people are um, apprehensive because they don't fully understand it. Um, the uh, system that we use, people recline, people tend to think it's like a dental chair uh, and in terms of reclining. Uh, the magnet itself is on a gantry um, and it's placed over a particular part of the brain. Sometimes people think, well, am I going to be in a MRI type of tube and enclosed, they're, they're, yeah. and enclosed and you're not. Uh, the gantry can move back and forth. So um, you, you, aim, you aim this magnet to the right part of the brain. Correct. We find the correct location uh, for each person. It's a little bit different for each person because the uh, size of the brain and skull is a little bit different. So we have to find the right location and then uh, somebody reclines, the magnet is placed next to that area uh, and it has pulses in what we call trains where there are multiple um, electromagnetic stimulations that happen for four seconds and then for 26 seconds, the magnet rests. That allows the magnet not to overheat. The whole process takes about 37 and a half minutes. Most people have 3,000 pulses, and that's about how long it takes. There's some variation in that. Uh, it takes uh, one treatment a day, five days a week, for four to six weeks. So a total of 20 to 30 treatments is the protocol that is usually typically used. I'm sorry, there, were, there was some, <laughs> a little noise came by and I, I missed that. So they go every day? Every day, for, four to six weeks, five days day a week. Every day four to six weeks. Uh, the reality is we miss some time because of whether it happens to be a holiday, whether it happens to be snow a few weeks ago and those types of things. So the critical piece isn't the five days a week, it's the accumulation of pulses over a period of time. So you need to live somewhat nearby where this is located. Uh, that, really. that certainly is desirable, though we've had people travel long distances. Um, how, how, how widespread is, is access to this technology? Like in Tennessee, is it is it just in the, the Knoxville and Chattanooga and Nashville and that, or is it more widespread than that? When we brought it to Tennessee in 2010, there were 123 systems in the country. Now there are over 600, maybe close to 650, uh, and there are about a, uh, a dozen or so in the state of Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, from Knoxville to Bristol to um, Lebanon, um, several in Nashville, uh, Jackson, Memphis. Uh, those are the areas which currently have systems. Okay. And is this something that's covered by most insurance? Uh, at this point, it is covered by uh, most people have coverage uh, in various insurance plans that do have some coverage of TMS at this point. It started out, the answer would be no. Um, that gradually has grown. Uh, Medicare started covering it in 2012. Uh, as of this year, Blue Cross of Tennessee covers it, though um, uh, we can get into it if you want to, but there are various uh, degrees of confusion about what exactly that means, and they haven't defined exactly criteria they're and moving process. in that direction, it sounds They like. are moving in that direction. United Healthcare now covers it in the state of Tennessee. Uh, so it's building in terms of insurance coverage. Okay. How is this different than ECT, which which people still are very leery about ever since that, that old movie with Jack Nicholson? 
Uh, ECT, which has been around for 70 or so years, uh, uses a generalized seizure. People are um, generally hospitalized, at least to begin ECT. They have anesthesia and sedation. Um, with each treatment, they're unable to drive for a period of time. And by causing that generalized seizure, it stimulates various areas of the brain uh, without a whole lot more understanding of exactly how it works. Uh, TMS is a focal treatment on an outpatient basis with no anesthesia, no sedation. People can drive to the office, they can drive home, they can go to work, to school, to the library, um, to the store, whatever they need to do uh, before and after. Is this something where you need to fail first with meds or psychotherapy or can somebody just go right to it because they don't want the side effects of meds or they don't want to take six months in therapy to feel better? Uh, Any and all of the above, uh, though that's where some of the insurance issues come into play. The actual uh, 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 clearance by the FDA indicates that it's effective after a failed trial of medication. Uh, And that has to do with the study's design. There there has not been a study on people who have not been on medicines. Uh, We have treated a couple of people, uh, one I can think of most recently, um, who uh, I knew peripherally um, and uh, came in to see me indicating that he, for the last six months, he had just been changing and he was more depressed. He was in his 30s. Um, He's active. He takes care of himself exercises, has a family take care of, but he noticed that his most effective month ever at work was last May, and then he's just declined in what he does. Went to his brother's wedding in early November, and his brother said, what's wrong with you? You're just not yourself. And he noticed that he hadn't been enjoying things. He was more withdrawn, but he came in and said, I know you're doing this. I'd heard about it, uh, and I really don't want to take medicines, he said. Um, I just don't like that concept and ask if we could do it. And, and we did treat him uh, with transcranial magnetic stimulation. And he had a very positive res- result um, and was very appreciative of uh, not having to be on the medicines, which may or may not cause side effects. Uh, so we're seeing a spectrum of things. Now, we get into some of the requirements by uh, insurance companies. For example, Medicare requires four failed antidepressants. Um, the Blue Cross criteria. Uh, indicates four failed antidepressants, including two augmentation strategies, which isn't clear exactly what they mean by that. Uh, And they require a course of uh, psychotherapy using rating scales uh, in order to meet all of that criteria. Then you can qualify for TMS. There's uh, a lot of people that don't, that will come in and say, uh, for example, uh, they've had psychotherapy in the past. It helped with their relationships and so forth, but right now they feel too depressed to even commit to going to a therapist and and talking about things, however valuable that might be. Uh, And they may have been on not four medicines or used augmentation, but they've been on enough medicines and maybe had side effects to it that they aren't pleased with. Um, And then there are other people who have met all the criteria, who uh, have been on multiple medications, been in psychotherapy, uh, and uh, so people will meet any number of criteria. but it's an individual, in my opinion, any of the treatments for depression, it should be individualized to the person and take into consideration their experience, their history, uh, and also their desires of what they want to accomplish. Are there known side effects? Because with depression, I think there's some evidence that that certain antidepressants have been associated with increased uh, suicide lethality. Um, which is the opposite of what you want from it. And they take a long time to work, and, and, and uh, they, there are side effects, and, the, and then people discontinue them. So uh, first, are there side effects? And second, do we think that it will become more readily accessible as it becomes better known and maybe the cost comes down? Uh, the side effects that we know of are discomfort at the site of the stimulation, The electromagnetic energy is stimulating the nerve fibers in the scalp. That people become accommodated to that and used to it as time goes on, so it tends to be not an issue. It's like a headache or more? Uh, More, more, a little bit sharper than that. It's only when the pulses are happening. Uh, And then as the treatment goes on over the first two to three treatments, that lessens and lessens and becomes not an issue. Uh, There is a small chance of seizure associated with this. It doesn't cause seizure disorder. 
um, and the but it can cause seizure activity. There have been nine and over six hundred and fifty thousand treatments thus far, uh, and it doesn't. It, the risk of seizure is less than most of the medicines that people take because that can lower the seizure. Well, nine and well. six hundred and fifty thousand episodes sounds like a really low number. I mean, of course, we'd like zero, but it's sure it would be more severe if if they continue to have seizures after. The Absolutely, treatment. and and so it's not a common side effect at all. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm excited to hear about this because for so long we've not had uh, really technologies. We have talk therapy and we have meds and we've helped, but I've also heard that the suicide rates are not lower in the last 20 or 30 years. While with cancer and heart disease and AIDS, we've done a lot better with decreasing deaths from these illnesses. So so I like the idea of newer treatments and, and better treatments, even though people do recover and people get better with what we have now. We'd like more people to get better and more quickly. We absolutely would. Uh, there is a relatively recent study uh, that Mark George out of University of uh, South Carolina, Charleston, uh, did. Dr. George has been responsible for a large part of the research with TMS. And it looked at uh, veterans coming back and had two sites that he looked at this. And when people were veterans returning from overseas uh, were depressed, suicidal, they used uh, TMS intensively over three days, several times a day, and uh, when they do this, they compare it to what they call sham treatment, which is a placebo type of treatment mm-hmm. that looks the same, sounds the same, but is not actual treatment. And people that had uh, the real TMS had a significant decline in their acute suicidality. That's um, exciting news. It is. Is this at all related to EMDR? I used to hear about that back when I was doing more direct clinical work, say 15 years ago. There was uh, EMDR, and the, the, which created a. It didn't use an outside device, but it was trying to, uh, I guess, uh, create stimulus in certain nerves. Which it was more about traumatic memory than than depression. But is this all at all related? It, it's not related in any specific way. Both. Uh count on what the brain does uh, as a mechanism of action. So with with EMDR, you're uh, highlighting certain parts of the brain to use the psychotherapeutic techniques while that's ongoing. Uh, With TMS, you're really looking at the geography of the brain and what it functionally does uh, and and helping that become more um, function the way it needs to function. Uh, so that it, it can people can feel back to themselves. Uh, we have so many people um, that indicate that they feel like they used to. Uh, one great y- news. I mean that that's what people want. It is one uh, young lady who I first started treating after college when she had a depressive episode. Twenty years later, after she was working at the family business, uh, had her two children, was married. Um, and she responded to antidepressants and did fairly well. Uh, she decided to have TMS. She had the treatment, and after the uh, last treatment, she hugged our TMS coordinator and said she finally feels joy again. Uh, that was several years ago, and after seeing her several times a year for about 20 years, uh, I now will get a Christmas card. <laughs> that- that that's that's really good to hear. Um, we're coming up on the halfway point of the show. We are with Dr. Scott West with Nash, Nashville TMS. This is the NAMI Radio Hour, and we will be back in about a half a minute or a minute.
You're listening to the NAMI Radio Hour on Radio Free Nashville, which is WRFNLP in Pasqua. You can listen over the air at 107.1 or 103.7 FM if you're in the Nashville area or online at www.radiofreenashville.org. This program is presented to you by NAMI Tennessee. And to learn more about NAMI, please go to our website at www.radiofreenashville.org. N-A-M-I-T-N dot org. And you can listen or learn about our classes, our support groups. Uh, we have a helpline. We, we have events coming up, such as the, the uh, Vision of Hope Gala, which will be May 13th in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And also NAMI.org. We're part of a national organization. All kinds of information about mental illness and programs and recovery. And back to our own website, we have um, support groups in about 30 locations all throughout Tennessee. These are all available for free, and it's a really wonderful place for family members to learn and get some support if they have a loved one with mental illness. These are family illnesses. They impact everybody in the family, and it helps families to stay intact and be a support to the uh, person who's, who's suffering from uh, the symptoms of mental illness when the family gets education and support. So we, we promote that, and I hope that people that are listening will take advantage of, of that opportunity. Uh, now I want to get back to our guest, Dr. Scott West of Nashville TMS, and we've been talking at length about TMS, which is an exciting new treatment for depression, which does not involve medication, and it's non-invasive uh, in any way and seems to have some good outcome. Uh, I would like to also go in more to just uh, depression and and what to do about it. First of all, you mentioned there's a whole lot of people with depression in a year. Uh, I think you said something like 12 or 18 million, and half of them get treatment. So how come only half? Um, it, it, it feels horrible. Uh, is it shame? Is it denial? But let, let's start there. Uh, I think you, I'm not sure the number, but you said half get, get help. Uh, approximately half of the people, half of the, the numbers I've seen range from 14 to 18 million people. and That's every year? That's per year in the United <sighs> it's States. A it's a lot of people. How does that compare with other illnesses to you? I mean, I, I know you can't have everything in your head with a, without knowing in advance, but that's got to be up there with pretty much any other illness. It, it is. Uh, within all the, the major type of illnesses, it's in the same uh, number range. Uh, why people don't get treatment, uh, the, the issues that you mentioned, there is the stigma that still exists. There's uh, the perception of embarrassment and shame uh, that might prompt people not to ask. But treatment. why stigma? Because you go to your family doctor, does anybody know? I mean, I guess you they ask, why are you here? And you have to tell somebody. But other than that, it's pretty private. Even talking to one person about it, some people feel that uh, they should be able to pull up their own bootstraps. I, I can remember one uh, preacher who I was treating one time telling me that he just always thought that it was um, just personal weakness uh, that uh, kept people uh, from being able to just take care of their own mood until he got depressed. And once he was depressed, he realized that it was not within his control. Now, one thing to realize is that depression as a word means lots of different things. We have um, the normal depression of life that happens, and there are things that we need to feel depressed about because that's how we should feel. Uh, but once it crosses some line, uh, it becomes out of the control. We know the brain is not functioning in a way uh, to effectively address mood in those instances. Are we talking about how long it goes on to talk about crossing the line or more how bad are the symptoms, or is it a combination? It's a combination. Uh, Technically, according to the criteria that's typically used, you have to be depressed for a couple of weeks and have a host of symptoms for um, every day uh, in order to qualify. What uh, are some of those symptoms? That has to do with a depressed mood. It has to do with sleep difficulty, appetite difficulty, feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, concentration difficulties, focus difficulties, uh, thoughts of uh, death and even suicide. Okay, so there's severity, there's length of time, and then not wanting to admit it. Is this worse with men? 
It does tend to be uh, worse with men, though most people in treatment are women. I mean, are men more likely to not want to talk about it because it's showing weakness? That typically their, is, that is one of the things that ha- tends to happen. Uh, and, and we see it play out not just in somebody's, how they're functioning in their own life and how they're feeling, but we're, we see it in terms of the loss of activity with uh, families, with um, with jobs. Uh, I had a wife of someone I was treating one time say he used to be fun. Uh, so when people aren't engaged anymore and um, with their families, the families are suffering too. Uh, we know that there are uh, millions of dollars of lost productivity in the employment area every year because of uh, uh, presenteeism. Uh, that's when people are hmm. present at work, but they're not actually functioning optimally because of depression. I've never heard that term, but so they're present, but they're not present. Correct. Okay. Now, what about social support? To is that even helpful? Because I, is, when you were talking about these symptoms, I think some people, when they're not enjoying anything, they also tend to pull away from everything, and it seems counterproductive. Because when you need it most to be part of things, you don't feel like it. Right, and I think that's one of the things that can help us understand to some degree the difference between the depression that might be part of life and the clinical depression that's more severe. Uh, when people uh, are depressed about something, they have a tough day at work or so forth, friends, family, and so forth can kind of pull them out of it. Let's go watch a movie. Let's go play ball. Let's go do something, and people can get engaged. Oftentimes with clinical depression, no matter what people try, the individual is not able to get engaged. Okay. So how do we help people be willing to talk about it and go see somebody if half our our for whatever reason, not seeking help. What 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 can be done? It, it helps with family members that, uh, or close friends, or anybody else that can um, notice something and, and communicate with the individual and ask what's going on. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it can be as simple as somebody saying, "You don't look like you feel well. What's going on?" So if we don't ask the question, we're not going to get an answer. If we do ask the question, we may not get an answer, but at least it starts the process. Okay, so um, if somebody seems different and it's going on for a while, ask. You know, we we talk about that with suicide when somebody talks about wanting to to. I'm not I'm not sure really exactly how to start it, but we last week our guest was was from Tennessee Suicide Prevention Network, and she said, "Go ahead and ask people if they're if they appear to be in a crisis. Are you thinking of of killing yourself?" But if somebody is, is uh, they always like to golf, but they don't golf anymore. If they like to play with their kids, but they can't get off, off the sofa, or they can't get, get out of bed, talk to them. Absolutely. Begin the conversation. That's the way to uh, facilitate and to help somebody open up and uh, begin to communicate about their own feelings. Sometimes people don't even know how to articulate it. Uh, if they've never felt that before, it's sometimes hard to say, uh, I feel depressed, but it might be easier to say, I don't feel like I'm worth much anymore. I don't have much hope for the future. And we're here in Tennessee, and there's um, uh, uh, large, strong faith communities in Tennessee. Do people go to their clergy if they're depressed and say, I don't feel right? And, and what are we hearing from, from that? Uh, I, I wonder about NAMI, and, and I've hoped that we could advocate clergy to just recommend that people get help. And, and, and at the same time, I've read that people that, that do have a religious faith and they're part of a faith community, that that, that uh, kind of gives a, a positive effect in, in well-being. It tends to, and when you look at the statistics, uh, people that are engaged in a faith community have a lower rate of depression, but it doesn't eliminate the rate of depression. Uh, And when people are open to it, going to clergy becomes an option, Um, sometimes because they'll feel comfortable with that uh, that setting. And and so clergy can be the opening door to uh, further treatment if that's needed. Okay. 
So that's maybe also part of it with the social support, because if you go to church and you're there every week and then you don't show up, then some of your church friends may ask how you're doing. Uh, that has been known to happen and, and can be a very helpful thing. So we think that's a that's a good idea, not a, not a bad idea. Um, so getting help is one thing. What what are ways? Are there things that people can do if they don't want to call a therapist? They don't want to think about meds. They're not ready for TMS. If if someone says, "Okay, yes, I'm depressed," are there things on their own that they could do where they could try that first? Just like. Uh, you know, maybe I don't want to take a blood pressure medicine, so I'm going to try and eat better and exercise first. If I don't make improvement, then I'll work with the doctor on a different plan. Uh, yes, there are things that we know in um, that are what I call common sense thinking, that if we take care of ourselves, our whole body is going to be better, our mind and our physical body. The uh, The exercise, the nutrition, getting good sleep, um, being involved in positive things, positive thinking, mindfulness activities, all are shown to help with depression. And that's wonderful when it works. When it doesn't work, continuing to go after that and go after that and go after that, but it's not working, is not healthy. Okay. Um, so if you're, I, I guess it's it's the same thing as what I was saying with blood pressure. If 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 my blood pressure is high and I begin to exercise and avoid salt and don't eat red meat or whatever, uh, if it doesn't come down, I still have high blood pressure. Correct. So just keep trying to do the same thing and expect things to be different is not, not optimal. And so there does come a time when it's important to say to somebody, um, I need to address this in a different way. Mm -hmm. And then that's where people have options. They go and uh, visit with somebody, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a psychiatrist, whatever the, uh, the clinical issue might be, and uh, they talk about it, and then they make a determination on, of the options available, what is the next step. Okay. Now, do you see anxiety as the same thing as depression, but it's just a different symptom cluster at that moment, or is that a separate disorder altogether? Th that's a really good question. There's a lot of overlap. One of the We know that people that... Uh, have chronic anxiety tend to get depressed and we know that people that have depression tend to have some degree of anxiety. Um, so I think it's a matter of how it's uh, manifested in different people. Uh, there are some people who have seemingly specific anxiety symptoms and others that have more depressive symptoms, but I do think that there is some crossover in that. Is there any indication that the TMS is helpful with anxiety? Yes, in the pivotal studies that were done, both the industry study and the uh, National Institute of Mental Health study uh, that was done, about a third of the people had comorbid anxiety disorders, and those improved as well. Well, that's exciting because I see anxiety also as being debilitating to people that, that are suffering from it and, and makes it harder for them to, to do many things in life. Uh, it certainly can be. Anxiety is... Um, Again, a normal emotion, but it can get to the point that it wrecks havoc on people. Well, I think of sleep, that uh, somebody may have depression and they have trouble sleeping, and then they get anxious about not sleeping, and it, it yes. makes a vicious cycle that, that becomes worse. Absolutely. Uh, so how much of your practice is people with depression, uh, roughly? Uh, probably... Uh, Two-thirds of my practice is specifically devoted to depression. So that's a very large portion. Uh, what about bipolar disorder? Uh, that is a, a mix with depression and with the manic symptoms, and uh, that accounts for a, a lot of distress in life. Both elements of that do. Um, and I see a number of people with bipolar disorder in my practice as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people with bipolar disorder have periods of depression, and when they're manic, they're enjoying themselves uh, maybe other people are not enjoying it so much but but they are having energy and they feel that they're creative and 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 and, and doing things and having passions but then there, there's the depression so uh, this is a, a separate syndrome is there is there any evidence that the TMS is helpful with bipolar disorder uh, yes there is there's uh, research that supports that our own clinical experience indicates that 
uh, people with bipolar disorder ha- and de- with a depressive episode have done very well with uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. That's good news because the, the depressive side of bipolar disorders is is very difficult, I know, for, for people that I've known personally. Uh, what about suicide? Uh, in your opinion, how many, as a percentage, what percentage of of suicides are directly associated with depression? My read of the literature is that the majority are associated with depression. Not all, but the majority of um, uh, su- successful suicides are. Okay, and then we, we had the case of, of Robin Williams, and for a week or two, people were focused on on depression and suicide, and then the, the, these things kind of fade. How, how do we how do we keep these issues in the forefront? That these are serious health issues, public health issues, and and if we don't pay attention to them and do better with them, we will continue to pay a high cost as a society. We know that uh, approximately fifteen percent of untreated depression will result in uh, suicide. Uh, it is a serious issue. I uh, wish we had the answer, even people that are treated, and I know of circumstances where people have been uh, very uh, professionally treated and we still have bad outcomes. So I don't know now how to uh, do away with uh, that as a potential outcome, but I do know that if left untreated, the rate is much higher. Yep. I, I hear that sometimes somebody will point to a tragic uh, outcome, and and I look at it, at it this way. Maybe it's correct. Maybe it's not. Um, with cancer, with heart disease, we have treatment, and sometimes we have bad outcomes. We want to have a, have less of them. <laughs> of course, we'd like to eliminate them, but but our our science and technology is not there yet but we can reduce the incidence of the bad outcome with treatment. That's true with mental health too, is it not? It's absolutely true, and that's why it is so important to begin the process of access to treatment um, so that an individual can uh, do the things that they need to to have an optimal uh, life for themselves. When I was at the NAMI National Convention last uh, September, Dr. Tom Insel was there, and I got to hear him speak about the um, mortality and morbidity of mental illness compared to cancer and uh, AIDS and heart disease. And he said we really haven't made as much impact on this overall compared to the others. And part of his talk was related to catching things earlier, and he introduced to me the term of of stage four, uh, which I've heard Mental Health America also talk about, to intervene before stage four, um, which with cancer, we have the stages and we want to identify and and treat earlier. So uh, how does this work with mental illness? Is is part of this, uh, I've been hearing about screenings during your physical for depression and, and suicide, suicidal ideation, or suicidality, I guess. Um, in the addiction field, we were teaching physicians years ago to try and ask questions about, are you, are you trying to cut down? Um, there, were, there was like four or five short questions. So we have to make it short for physician screenings. But then like schools, doctor's offices, should we be screening for depression or other mental illness? I think we should, uh, in any clinical setting, be uh, screening for uh, mental illness. There are some rating scales that are fairly easy to use uh, that can at, that are not definitive, but that can at least guide people um, in a particular direction. Uh, we're not making as much progress as some other illnesses, um, but we are making progress. And I think that they really dovetail together uh, with diabetes and coronary artery disease. Over 60% of people with those diagnoses have clinical depression. Uh, It gets to be a chicken and egg issue that if we don't treat their depression, they're not going to be as compliant with their medicines, their treatment regimen, their exercise requirements, and so forth. So if we treat their depression, then they're likely to be more compliant and thus be more well, uh, accessing the healthcare system less, 
Um, and so it builds on itself. If we can treat the depression and these other illnesses, we're going to help the other illnesses. But we've got to get around to figuring out how to treat the depression or the anxiety or the psychosis in those other illnesses. And the rating scales or screenings are a good way to begin that process. Well, that sounds good. And I think another part is to break down the walls between mental health and physical health, which you as a psychiatrist, you're trained as a as a physician. But we've tended to have these separate systems. And I see movement toward integrating mental health and physical and overall health. Now, that doesn't mean we won't need specialists, but that's true with, with medical illnesses too. You have a, a family doctor and then you have specialists. Um, but meanwhile, today we also have a system as it is where a lot of it is the individual, if they have insurance, they choose a provider and they go where they go and they get referred where they get referred. So what do we say to the um, to that person? Um, how do you choose well? How do you work to have a good relationship with your provider? Advocate for yourself. Ask what, what you need. Uh, we, have, we have a few minutes left, and, and I'd like to focus on that. I encourage people to look at uh, finding any mental health provider as an opportunity. Uh, And they have that opportunity to interview somebody uh, to make sure they're comfortable in that setting. Uh, If, in fact, it has to do with uh, somebody they're referred by an insurance plan, uh, if they're comfortable with it, great. But if they're not comfortable, then it's people do need to advocate for themselves and they can either discuss that directly with the provider or they can talk to their insurance company and tell them they need an alternative. Uh, so so com- there is- let's break that down. So comfortable that that um, they're seeing me as as I, I feel they care about me. Uh, I'm I can share things with them that I might not comfortably share with others. Uh, Correct. The that time, they, they, how my, how I'm treated, and in my given time, they feel respected and that they feel comfortable enough to be able to say what's really on their mind because if they don't if they're holding stuff back it's not going to be nearly as effective Mm -hmm. okay and then um, can I ask a doctor about a particular medicine or is that the job of the doctor and 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 that's overstepping my my uh, my own opinion is that it's it's up to you to ask whatever questions are on your mind Um, as doctors we I think are more comfortable now that with all of the media, all of the internet, and the knowledge, the information that's out there now, our patients are more and more informed, more and more educated about things. So I, I make an assumption that people are going to come with questions, and they may have some specific questions uh, about something for any number of reasons, and I think those are open for discussion. Okay. Um, and how do I find out who's who's a good provider uh i wouldn't know what to do myself except for ask around or just hope to get lucky uh you know asking friends and other people that you trust whether it be a primary care provider whether it be a clergy member uh, whether it be family member getting a referral is where it starts but beyond that um all the stuff on the internet now uh, it's like a lot of things on the internet it's some's good some's uh, worth looking at, some's not, but uh, I think that you have to interact with the individual and see what your level of comfort is in that interaction. Okay, so trust your gut, I think is what, what you're saying. Good way to put it. Yes. Um, we have we have just a couple minutes left. I'd like to give you the opportunity just to share um, anything that you would like that's related to your role as a psychiatrist and what's happening with with mental health. One, I would like to thank NAMI for what it does. O- over the years, it's provided a very uh, important aspect of uh, supporting the family members of people that are struggling in various ways. Um, and also to indicate that uh, psychiatry remains an exciting area because despite the difficulties that people might have, uh, there are, in most instances, people are going to improve and, and frequently they get well. Uh, so it's while there's still struggles with peop- with the circumstances that are chronic and persistent and severe, um, the first thing is to open up the discussion for what can happen and then make the best choices you can as time goes on. 
It sounds to me like you're discussing mental illnesses the same as other illnesses that some people get better and they move on with life, which which is a, a strange idea to some. It, it may be particularly those that struggle with the chronicity of it, uh, but so often things can be better even if not well, and so it's worth putting in the effort to do that in, I think, a holistic fashion. Okay. And how do people find you if they, they would like to, to follow up? Uh uh, we have a website, uh, nashvilletms.com. Okay. And you take folks from Middle Tennessee and, and beyond, and you work with them. So do you have a waiting list? A lot of psychiatrists have waiting lists. I, the, it's, I have more of a, a wait now than I used to, um, but we get people in as quickly in, as possible, and we'll let people know if we have cancellations and such. Okay. Uh, you have been listening to the NAMI Radio Hour, and our guest is Dr. Scott West, who is a psychiatrist and also the, the owner of Nashville TMS. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, be with us today. I want to share a couple other things just about what's happening with NAMI Tennessee. If you were here for the beginning of the show, I talked about Insure Tennessee, which um, had a bad outcome at the uh, legislator yesterday, legislation, legislative hearing yesterday, where where it was voted down by a Senate committee, and it looks like it may not get a floor vote, and we will not get in uh, Insure Tennessee this year. Uh, this is a program that would expand health insurance coverage for low income people who um, do not get ten care, but do not make enough money to be eligible for insurance under the Affordable Care Act on the exchange. So this has different names. Some people call it Obamacare. Some people talk about Medicaid expansion. We heard Senator Overby yesterday discuss how it's different from Obamacare because it's a Tennessee solution that that has some patient accountability in it, uh, and it was going to cost nothing to the taxpayers of Tennessee to have this insurance. coverage. A lot of the folks who do not have insurance currently are people with mental illness. We also have 28,000 veterans without insurance coverage. We have a lot of people that are just working part-time jobs or working in a company that that, that pays low and they just don't make enough to qualify through the exchange. And we need your help. If you feel that this is important, please contact your local legislator. Let them know that you're in favor of Insure Tennessee. It's not too late to do it. Uh, the advocates have not given up. It may not happen this year, but we would like to ha- have it happen next year. I heard testimony about some really heart-wrenching cases of people that uh, there was a lady that, that had worked in a factory, had cancer, had to quit working because her illness was was too bad. She's getting treatment for cancer without the income, no 10 care, uh, no Affordable Care Act. And this is somebody that had worked 25 or 30 years for one company. I heard a legislator say that we don't need to do this because it's able-bodied people. Well, a lot of people that have mental illness may look able-bodied, but they're having symptoms, as we've been hearing uh, Dr. West speak about that interfere with their ability to function, to get up and get out of bed and go to work and, and, and stay gainfully employed. Treatment could have made a difference and had that person working. So contact your legislator. Let them know that you think that this is important. Another thing I'd like to talk about is uh, NAMI Tennessee is working with Tennessee Voices for Children, and we've developed a curriculum for something called a family support specialist. And that is a person that's had a child with mental illness, and uh, they have um, gained experience in navigating the system and advocating for their child, and they now like to help others. So there's a certification through the state of Tennessee for a family support specialist. We have a training class that is required uh, in order to receive this uh, certification, and you can learn more about that by contacting Tennessee Voices for Children or going to the NAMI Tennessee website, which is namitn.org. So uh, thank you, Dr. West, for being here. Thank you, Jeff. 
Also, thank you, Radio Free Nashville, for allowing NAMI Tennessee the, this spot every week. It is every Wednesday. Please uh, sign up for our Facebook or our e news to learn about it. And if you like what's happening with Radio Free Nashville, we're having our 10 year birthday party. We're celebrating, and it will not be a party without you. So get your tickets today and join us at eventbrite.com and search for Radio Free Nashville. Now, I haven't said tickets for what yet.